So excited to be able to continue on in our series in Luke. We've reached chapter 21. We're, we're moving along, right? It's exciting. Um, as we've been looking in the, in the previous weeks, Jesus and, and the disciples have been in the temple. We're kind of in these last days of Christ's time on earth before his death and, and resurrection. And so Jesus has been kind of sparring with the, with the teachers, with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And, and you can tell Jesus' focus in times like this are, are really important. He, he has very few moments left where it's just him and the disciples. And so in chapter 21, we're going to be going today, he, they're taking a walk from the temple out to the Mount of Olives. And so he has a chance just to continue to help them focus. Our, our sermon title today is Proper Focus. He wants them to be focusing on the right things. And this is important, right? We, we recognize in life it's being focused is good, being focused on the right things is really important, though. We don't want to be spending all of our time and energy focused on the wrong things. Um, when I was a kid, I was focused. Uh, but people didn't really tell me the things that I was focusing on weren't going to last. I excelled in lots of things, but two of those things, <laughs> two of those things, two sports I excelled in, one, tetherball, Anybody? <laughs> nobody tells you, oh, yeah, nobody plays tetherball after elementary school is over. Uh, I had a tetherball court in my backyard. I had an older brother. I could, you know, try to compete against him. And then when I was against people my own age, I worked everybody. I was the tetherball champion. Um, and that doesn't matter. No point in focusing your children. Don't focus on tetherball. It doesn't last. The other one was kickball. Does anybody tell you? Oh, by the way, I know you're really good at kickball, but it doesn't last. Once you're out of elementary school, you're never going to play it again, and nobody's going to care that you're the best kickball player that this school has ever seen. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, I was focusing on the wrong thing. So I, I brought a couple pictures. I was in my old neighborhood. I grew up in Long Beach. This is actually a creepy picture of an adult taking a picture by an elementary school. <laughs> but it's, it's me. And that's my elementary school. This is where I played kickball, right here. Well, you can go to the next picture. And this is my vantage point. Home plate, kickball. So you had two things. There were, you know, I focused a lot on this. There were two things to do. If you got the perfect baby bouncies pitch, you know, oh, <laughs> you could wait on it and go opposite field, and you can see the lunch tables over there, right? If you got it into the lunch tables, it was bouncing around, everybody's confused, and you bought yourself a lot of time. Uh, my older brother, Josh, I'll just say this, the first service doesn't have this information. My older brother, Josh, is left-handed, and so he could pull it, he kicked it over that building into the next school one time. It's like, it's not just urban legend, it's true, it's true. <laughs> the other thing you could do, if you weren't going to wait on it, is you can't see, but down this way, the blacktop goes forever. It goes past, th that building stops, I mean, just runs for days. So I would like jump on the pitch early, pull it that way, it would run, and I promise you, I'm not making this up to make a point about the Bible. This is a true story. I kicked it so hard one time that I ran to first, I ran to second, I ran to third. I observed how, f they hadn't even gotten to the ball yet, and I crawled. I got on my hands and knees to taunt and humiliate everybody I was beating. I crawled my way to home plate. And I mean, maybe that doesn't really matter, but now you guys know, I feel, I feel good about it. But I was, <laughs> I was focused on the wrong things. I would come home, tell my parents about the big soccer, or not soccer, I was horrible at soccer. Horrible. Kickball. Tell my parents about the good kickball game we had, and they're like, oh, cool. But they were never like, Joel, why do you care about this? This doesn't last. Like, what about reading? Did you read? Did you do any math today at school? Did you like kill a math test? I was like, kickball. I was focused, focused, focused. And they let me, my family let me down. I mean, they, they let me pour my energies into a very fleeting endeavor. Um, Jesus would not do that for the disciples, right? They're in these last days, and he is like saying, listen, you have to focus on what I'm telling you. Th things are going to change in the future, and, and you have got to focus on what I'm telling you. 
And he saw right away as we jump into chapter 21, verse 5, that he's in his last days on earth, and their focus was not in the right place. They had just been in the temple talking, you know, having these arguments with the, 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 really, the people of God were being led astray by the religious leaders. That's what Jesus was focused on, Get riding the ship, getting people focused on God, getting people to know that he's the Messiah, and walking from the temple after all this happened towards the Mount of Olives where they were going to stay for the night. This is what the disciples say, verse 5. Some of his disciples began talking about the majestic stonework of the temple and the memorial decorations on the walls. And Jesus is like, guys, really? This is what we're talking about, how pretty the temple is. Like, th- this, is, this is go time. My, my life is almost over. My, my time on the earth is, is almost over. So what Jesus does is he, he, he has a moment of, of prophecy where he prophesies to his disciples about three things that are, that are yet to come. So in prophecy, we, we usually divide prophecies into one of two categories, and since theologians want to seem smarter than everybody, they make words really close together, but they really mean different things. So you, do, you have one of two things in prophecy, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament. You have foretelling, which is like God revealing to this prophet, this is what's going to happen in the future, right? So all the prophecies we have in the Old Testament about the Messiah, those are foretellings. And then you have forth tellings, right? See how clever? It's clever. Forth telling. Forth telling is just speaking truth. Because at, at the end of the day, prophecy is speaking things that are true. It, it's, it's taking from God a message and delivering it to people, whether it's about the future or about what is. That's what makes it forth telling or foretelling. Almost, I mean, the vast majority of prophecy is forth telling. A, a prophet going to a people and saying, you've turned away from God and you need to turn back, right? That's the most common prophetic message. But we have a moment here where Jesus is saying, this is what's going to happen in the future. I want you to know about these three things that are going to happen, not just so that you know, but so that you know where to focus your attention. When these things happen, here's what I want you to do. Does that make sense? It's not about the events themselves. Those aren't the end. He's letting them know that those happen so they aren't caught off guard and they know how to, how to appropriately respond. So the first event that Jesus foretells is that the temple is going to be destroyed, which, I mean, he's kind of a conversation killer, right? These guys are like, oh, the temple is so beautiful. It's gorgeous, monument stones. And then Jesus says this in verse 6. The time is coming when all these things will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Teacher, they asked, when will all this happen? What sign will show us that these things are about to take place? He replied, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and saying the time has come, but don't believe them. And when you hear wars, hear of wars and insurrections, don't panic. Yes, these things must take place first, but the end won't follow immediately. Then he continues on in verse 20, talking about the um, destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. He says this in verse 20. And when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you will know that the time of its destruction has arrived. Then those in Judea must flee to the hills, those in Jerusalem must get out, and those in the country should not return to the city. So that was very countercultural. In those days, you built, this is why you built cities. You built fortifications so that when the enemy was there, you had a place of of shelter to retreat to. And Jesus is saying, not this time. When Jerusalem is surrounded, leave. Get out of here. For those days, for those will be days of God's vengeance. And the prophetic words of the scriptures will be fulfilled. How terrible it will be for pregnant women and for nursing mothers in those days. For there will be disaster in the land and great anger against this people. They will be killed by the sword or sent away as captives to all the nations of the world. And Jerusalem will be trampled down by the Gentiles until the period of the Gentiles comes to an end. Okay, so it's pretty heavy. And and all of that took place. So Jesus is is prophesying this around 30 AD, that, that time period. And around 70 AD, Rome did come in 
They took over Jerusalem, they destroyed the temple, and it has never been rebuilt since, right? Now we're in 2018, and Jesus' words still ring true to this day. God's people have never gone back and been able to to rebuild the temple. But what Jesus wants his disciples to know at that time, I mean, this is is major stuff that's going to happen. But he wants them to know that God is in control, right? When When our surroundings seem chaotic, God is still in control. He wasn't caught off guard. In AD 70, God wasn't like, whoa, what happened? He he knew that this was coming, and Jesus wanted the disciples to know this was coming. But you can imagine being in their situation as as Jewish men with with good lineage, some of them, that, you know, going back generations and generations, there was this whole period of the exile for a long time, and God's people came back, and, and now the temple's been rebuilt. It's been expanded under King Herod. And things are in a good place. They're moving into a good place politically for the Jewish people. And to think, it's all going to go away. It, it's going to be destroyed. What, what we put our, our hope in is this, this system. We, we put our hope in this, this place where God meets with his people. And, and now you're going to tell us the, where we take our sacrifices. It's, it's all going to go away. But Jesus wanted them to know that even if the temple of God is destroyed. God still reigns. The temple, as as beautiful as it is, it is not, and even from the first day it was opened, was not considered to be the actual specific location of of Jehovah. If we look back, Brandon was reading from 1 Kings 8, um, before that that song we did earlier. 1 Kings 8.27, Solomon says this, as he, this is the day that they're opening the temple, a thousand years before Jesus is prophesying. And it says, Solomon said, but will God really live on earth? Why, even the highest heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple that I built. Solomon knew God was not going to be crammed in a building. And God will continue to survive and move forward and move his purposes forward whether or not that building exists. So Jesus wanted to prep his people. But why? He he gave them a couple things to focus on because they needed to know that God still reigns even when things we inappropriately put our trust in fail. Right? Religious institutions fail. Religious leaders fail. Things that, that we look up to, they They fail, but it doesn't mean that God has failed. And Jesus didn't want them to get lost in the weeds, so he gives them a couple things um, not to focus on and something to focus on. First, he says, don't focus on knowing the precise timing of everything. This is the first message Jesus is trying to get across. In verse 8, we read, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come claiming that they're the Messiah and that the time has come don't believe them. These are not the things that we need to be focusing on. As as the time comes, Jesus didn't want them to be thinking, okay, is it now? This guy says this and and, and spending all their time there. And, you know, we we go through the same thing in in our day. We look at biblical prophecy and, and, man, we can really move a lot of our attention and resources to trying to figure out exact specifics of when everything's going to happen. And Jesus is like, that's not the big deal. The big deal isn't when. The big deal is that God reigns. Don't focus on the precise timing of everything. The other thing he says is he's trying to get them not to focus on the chaos of what's going to happen. It's going to be crazy. But you can't just, just sit there and, and perseverate on, on the chaos. In verse 9 he says, And when you hear of wars and insurrections, don't panic. He doesn't want them to get caught up in in the moment and everything that's happening and and think that all is lost. Instead, so those are two don'ts. Don't focus on the precise timing. Don't focus on the chaos. Instead, verse 22, he wants us to focus on following Jesus. This had to be a hard phrase for the disciples to hear. For those will be days, the days when the temple and Jerusalem are destroyed. Those will be days of God's vengeance. He he didn't say those will be days where Rome finally takes over and they're too powerful for us to hold back. No, those will be days of God's God's vengeance. Why? Why would God destroy the temple? Why would God allow Rome to 
to send people off into another exile. They've, they've just, you know, a few hundred years ago, been through a whole period of, of exile. I mean, I can't tell you for sure, but based on previous history in the Bible, whenever God's people start depending on other stuff, he lets it go. He, he gets rid of it. And if this temple and the, the, all these extra laws and leaders and stuff they had made, if that's what they're now putting their trust in, God's not afraid to let it just go by the wayside so that they can focus on him and know that he rules and reigns. It's not about the building. It's not about the rules. It's about knowing God. It's about being near to God. So that's the first thing he tells them. The temple's going to be destroyed. But focus on me. The, the people had, were at that time largely rejecting Jesus. They were largely rejecting the Messiah who had come to save them. And so Jesus is like, don't <laughs> focus. Focus on me. The second thing that he tells them is going to happen is a time of great persecution. So he says in verse 12, but before all this occurs, so before the temple is destroyed, this is what's going to happen. There will be a time of great persecution. You will be dragged into synagogues and prisons, and you will stand trial before kings and governors because you are my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. So don't worry in advance about how to answer the charges against you, for I will give you the right words and such wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to reply or refute you. Even those closest to you, your parents, brothers, relatives, and friends will betray you. They will even kill some of you. And everyone will hate you because you are my followers. But not a hair of your head will perish. By standing firm, you will win your souls. So the kind of the big message Jesus is trying to get across is that God allows his followers to suffer. Why? Because of his love for people that don't follow him. God, God is willing for us to suffer so that others can see the hope that we have. And what Jesus was predicting specifically for that time period of, you know, 30 AD to 70 AD, before the temple falls, there would be great persecution. There continued to be persecution, obviously, after, and there continues to be today. God's followers face pain and difficulty directly because they follow him. And so what Jesus wants to tell them is not just, hey, this is going to happen, but what, where should they place their focus? The first thing he says is don't focus on the pain. Don't focus on the pain. It's temporary. In verse 16, he says, you know, these people are going to betray you. They'll even kill some of you. And then it's kind of just amusing. He says they're going to kill you. And then he says, but not a hair of your head will perish. So clearly, like, he's trying to either say, like, someday, like, in eternity is what matters. This death is not going to last. Or he's saying they're going to kill you, but you're still going to have an awesome hair day. That's possible. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think that's, I think it was the first. I think he's trying to tell him, everything is temporary. This pain isn't going to last. And this holds true in other areas of life. When facing pain, we can choose to focus on the pain, to, to live in our pain and, and see how acute it is, or we can focus on the outcome. Um, I've never given birth. I don't know if you guys knew that, but I've never, I've never given birth. But I have been to childbirthing classes, and so on no authority of my own, I'm not here to judge any person that's had a child, um, but I can say they, what they teach in these classes, they teach expectant mothers to, during the birthing process, focus on the outcome. Focus on the baby. Don't just think about the pain. Again, I'm not judging any mom, so if you're like, don't think about the pain. It's not me. It's the lady who taught my class, right? She's, it's not, no judgment. No ju I'm in no place to judge. I'm just, I'm just transmitting information that I've heard from another source. But they really think that if you think about the outcome of things, if you think about the end, this is just an illustration, right? Again, it's just an illustration. 
But we societally and biblically agree that childbirth is extraordinarily painful. But we can help like mitigate some of that pain by knowing what, what the end is. And so Jesus is doing that for his disciples. He's saying you're going to experience extraordinary difficulty. He's never hidden that from them. And we, we don't hide it here. Being a Christian can be very difficult. Following the things of Jesus can alienate you from people that you care about. We aren't trying to do that, but it happens. And so Jesus is saying, don't focus on what you're suffering. Focus on the outcome. Focus on telling people about me, he says in verse 13. He says, while you're suffering, this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. Don't miss the opportunity. And we saw this exact thing happen. As people like Stephen were, were killed for their faith in Acts, he has a moment in front of all these leaders to say, this is what's happened in the past. This is who God has been through the ages. This is who he is now. And Jesus is the fulfillment of all that God's been doing. And then they killed him, but he got to deliver this message to people that didn't know the truth. The other thing he says, to, he says, focus on telling people about me, but he says, don't focus on the specifics of what to say. In verse 14, he says, don't worry in advance about how to answer the charges against you. And, and on in verse 15, he says, I'll give you the right words. Don't, don't get lost in the details. Just be ready. Be ready to tell people about me. And be ready, lastly, to, to stand firm. Verse 19, he says, focus on standing firm. It's interesting when you think about who was present at this time. You know, you have these disciples. Pastor Brian talked, I think, last week or the week before about how many of them suffered a martyr's death. They were ready to stand firm in Jesus um, just a few short years later. But one of them really stands out to me, Peter, because later on, you know, a couple decades later, he's writing a letter now in First Peter. He's, he's writing to believers that are suffering the way that Jesus said it was going to happen. They're in the middle of what Jesus had predicted, and so he has the perfect words to give them because Jesus had said, this is what's going to happen, and this is what you need to focus on. So Peter now writes a letter, and he says this in, in 1 Peter 3, 14 and 15, but even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't, don't worry or, or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as the Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. In the next chapter, chapter 4, verse 19, he says, So if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to the God who created you, for he will never fail you. In the next chapter, he goes on, 5, verse 10, he says, In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you've suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation. This is how we stand firm, knowing that it's, it's for a short time, but as we focus on, on Christ, we know that we have a firm foundation to stand on, and, and we can get through anything that might come. Through. Our, our hair is going to be great long term, right? It's going to work out if we keep our eyes focused on Jesus. The third thing that um, Jesus predicted, so the, these first two, historically, we know that they happened. In, in, you know, Jesus is predicting it in 30 AD. Persecution of, of believers started really as soon as Jesus ascended into heaven and certainly carried on through 70 AD when Jerusalem fell. I mean, all those things are just like precise on. Um, the third thing that he foretells is still yet to come. Um, Jesus says that he's going to return in glory, right? We're still waiting. We're still waiting for this to happen. Uh, but since this is a, a, a foretelling, uh, one image that, that I've been taught about was sometimes when, when prophets are prophesying, it's as if they're standing. I'll show you a picture of a mountain range. This is the Himalayas. Our Nepal team could see this view just very soon. Um, but as a prophet, you're standing looking in a way, at, at this message God wants to deliver. And things look very together. They look close. They look almost two-dimensional, um, even though they're, they're huge and massive. So 
so Jesus or a, another prophet are, are telling you, all they're doing is saying, this is what God wants you to see. They aren't there to give like a, a play-by-play, every moment-by-moment systematic thing that's going to happen. God wants you to know something that's going to happen so that he can teach you something. And so what often happens, you can look at the, this next, next picture, it's a great drawing. Um, stick man with some triangles. But if we took a cross section of that mountain range and like flipped it, and now we're looking at the prophet, what's weird is the mountains that are closest to him are actually like way closer to him than they are to the far mountains. Does that make sense? Like if I'm looking at a mountain range, the closest mountain might be 50 miles from me. The, the farthest mountain could be 400 miles from me. And so that's what's seems to be happening in Jesus' prophecy, is he's, he's telling them, hey, this stuff is going to happen. Some of it is going to happen this year, right? Persecution is going to start next week. The destruction of the temple is going to happen 40 years from now, and his coming back is now we're, you know, plus 2,000 years, or almost plus 2,000 years. So, but he's not saying these are the exact times because he's already said, don't worry about the exact time. Does that make sense? I just know that it's going to happen. Um, so I'll, I'll throw that out there. Here, let's, so let's jump into what he says about what is still to come for us. In verse 25, he says, and there will be strange signs in the sun, moon, and stars. And here on earth, the nations will be in turmoil perplexed by the roaring seas and strange tides. People will be terrified at what they see coming upon the earth, for the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then everyone, seemingly everyone on the earth, will see the Son of Man coming on a cloud with power and great glory. So when all these things begin to happen, stand up, stand and look up, for your salvation is near. Then he gave them this illustration. Notice the fig tree or any other tree. When the leaves come out, you know without being told that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things taking place, you can know that the kingdom of God is near. I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass from the scene until all these things have taken place. Very confusing, right? This generation will not pass from the scene until all these things have taken place. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, because it's confusing, and it's been confusing to theologians for a lot longer than I've been alive. I'll just tell you, I'll kind of give you a synopsis of the things that I've read. Clearly, like, Jesus hasn't come down in glory with everybody seeing him, and all the people that heard him say this are dead, right? Is that fair? So we have to figure out, like, what are the, kind of what are the options of what could be happening here? And I don't want to explain away the words of, of the Bible, so we'll just, we'll move quickly, but there are kind of three things people think Jesus could have intended with what was written down. One is the, the meaning of the word generation. So generation is, doesn't always mean um, the group, a group of people living at the same time for a general lifetime on the earth. It can also mean a type of people. Just like, like science has taken like the genus, you know, the Latin, it's, it's similar. It could mean, I tell you the truth, this type of people will not pass from the scene. Which type of people? So scholars have complete opposite views. Briefly, they are saying believers who are suffering. That's what Jesus was previously talking about. Believers are going to suffer until the end of days. Th- those type of people will not pass from the scene. Believers will be around. Some people think that's not what he means. He means like Gentiles and persecutors of God's people because he was talking about that group. It could be either one. I'm not here to tell you which one. I'm just giving you information. The other thing that people think is that they try to pick apart all these things and say maybe he's only talking about the persecution in Jerusalem. I don't know what grounds you have to say that, but I'm just giving you guys the information of what's there, and we're going to move forward because what I don't want to do is lose focus on where we are and do the opposite of what Jesus is trying to tell us to do in this passage. So we're going to move forward, but now you have that information. Um, Okay, so verse 33, heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. Watch out. Don't let your hearts be dulled 
by carousing and drunkenness and by the worries of this life. Don't let that day catch you unaware like a trap, for that day will come upon everyone living on the earth. Keep alert at all times and pray that you might be strong enough to escape these coming horrors and stand before the Son of Man. So this is the message that Jesus is giving us. He is coming back in glory and power, and he is everything. He will be the one that we stand before at the end of time. Jesus is everything. The, the big message, look expectantly for him. Depend on him. That's what he wants his, his disciples to do. Focus on him. Don't focus on the world's answers. They, they won't answer this question. How, how do I stand before Jesus at the end of time? Nothing that the world offers us is going to answer that most important question. We can't depend on those. We can only depend on Jesus. So in verse 34, he says, Don't let your hearts be dulled by carousing and drunkenness and by the worries of this life. I, I, worry can, can invade us in such a way that, that we check out for, from really focusing on the things that God wants us to focus on. And, and clearly, like, he's talking about substance abuse. Car- if you don't use carousing in your daily language, it's like, it's basically partying, like drunken partying. Um, but, but these things that people use, you know, drunkenness, carousing, anything that culture is doing to really help them forget about reality and to distract themselves, to, to focus on other things. Jesus is saying those don't work. But I can say this whole week preparing for this message, I was really, really convicted by this. This is the only time period I've ever lived in, but I have to assume that It is as easy, if not easier, than ever to distract yourself from reality. We, we like, carry distractions around in our pockets, right, Uh, that we can can just check out. We can pixelate into any situation. We we, we can remove ourselves from reality. We can remove ourselves not just, this is, this boggles my mind, not just from the unseen reality. There's an unseen reality that, that God exists, and he loves everybody, and he wants to reach them, and there's a whole unseen world. We not only distract ourselves from that, we distract ourselves from the scene, the visible reality around us. I do. And so it was very telling. I went to um, my daughter's pre-K class on Friday. It was Donuts with Daddy Day. And so they gave me this little folder. It was waiting for me. And what they did is they, this is my daughter, Izzy. She's wearing a Lakers shirt. And that, she'd be cute without the Lakers shirt, but then you put that on and it's like, Yes. Um, so they ask Izzy questions about me and they write down whatever she says and then I get to see what they, what they wrote down so she says my dad is 8 years old and weighs 6 pounds <laughs> so before we get into anything that's actually convicting to my soul she's not a real accurate source right? We've just, <laughs> that's been declared my dad's hair is brown. My dad likes to wear Snoopy shirts. I do have a Snoopy shirt. Um, my dad is really good at golf. So she knows some things, r- dead on, right on the money. <laughs> my dad is really good at golf. If I had $1,000, I would buy my dad a golf ball. <laughs> Later on, she says my dad's favorite TV show is shows about golf. She also says, my dad likes to eat mac and cheese and drink wine. Um, My dad always says, I love you, and there's other important stuff in here. But she didn't one time write, my dad loves to tell me about Jesus. My dad loves to, to serve our neighbors or tell everybody he can that Jesus saved him from death, and he'll live forever. I'm not expecting her to write those things, but the number of times she mentioned something golf-related, and I'm like, I haven't played a full round of golf, like 72, you know, par 72 round in like, I mean, probably 11 months and six days. It's been like a long time. (laughs) I don't even know how long it's been. But man, there are people around that see what we care about, value, and focus on better than we do, especially those little people. They, they really don't pull any punches either. But we can't escape focusing on God to just follow the things of the world. We will not be part of God's story of bringing salvation to humanity. 
unless we lean in and we say, God. And that's why the, the, the last thing Jesus says, it fits right in, is, is he says, focus on praying for strength. It's going to be hard. It's not easy. It's not easy to focus on God. It's not easy to have the strength to, to withstand what the world is throwing at us. But Jesus is saying, that's why you need me. Depend on me, not just for for the ideas, but depend on me for the strength. I want to live out my life through you with my power, my strength, my influence, my ability to soften hearts, my ability to forgive. Those are the things that I want to dispense to the people you know and love. So talk to me. Pray with me. Seek me to be your strength. Don't seek the world to try to figure out how to just dull our hearts, as, as, to use the words Jesus used. These things that Jesus brought up, the destruction of the temple, the persecution of believers, his ultimate coming in glory, these are going to happen. They either did or they're going to happen. And so he wants his disciples, he wants you and me to be ready to know not just that it's going to happen, but when it happens, what's our focus? Where are our hearts and minds? What are we dedicated to? Where do we move? How do we be his people? So the band's going to come out. We're going to worship God in, in song as we close our service. But as we do, there were a lot of, Jesus had a lot of, do focus on this, don't focus on these. So I just want to recap as we begin to sing the do's. Here's what Jesus said. Focus on these. Focus on following Jesus. Focus on telling people about Jesus. Focus on standing firm. And focus on praying for strength. These aren't groundbreaking, brand new ideas. But Jesus wants over and over to bring us back to a place of dependence on him. What's stealing your focus? What's got you distracted? from leaning into your relationship with God? What has you distracted from bringing the good news of Jesus to everybody around you? Just as we sing, just spend some time with God. Pray for strength. Pray for opportunity. Even if that involves suffering, even if it involves difficulty, pray for opportunity. And as we sing, if you'd like prayer for anything, we'll have a a couple people up here that you can pray with. If you want somebody to pray with you for strength in your week this week, come forward. They would love to pray with you. Let's worship God together.